So a quick turnaround as we get to part two of uh, the real story. Um, now, it's interesting. I, I remember you know, coming across, you, you probably all know the serenity prayer, which is, God grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, the courage to change the things I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. Then I came across what someone described the, as the entrepreneur's prayer, and it was, God grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, the courage to change the things I can, and the wisdom to hide the bodies of the people I kill because they piss me off. With those words of wisdom, the next panelist, I'm going to ask them up. Dr. John Hatsopoulos, please, lead director, uh, Tecogen Inc. for the late George Hatsopoulos. He's co-founder of Thermo Electron Corporation. Please come on up, sir. Good Thank to see you. you. Thank you, sir. Grab a seat. Uh, Douglas Rao is with us, founder and president of The Daily Table and former CEO of Conscious Capitalism, also past president of Trader Joe's, which has kept me very happy. <laughs> Great to see you, sir. Come on up. And Peter Sprague is the chairman and founder of Satellite Displays and former chairman of National Semiconductor Corporation. Come on up, Peter. Thank you, sir. You got it. Good. We'll be all right. So I, I guess um, I, I could start off with the same question to you about the, the idea about rules, where, where Diane, yesterday Diane von Furstenberg had said, make rules and then break them. And I'm wondering, on the, the kind of different paths you've taken, what rules you've made and then what you had to break. Peter, perhaps you could start. Well, I very much appreciated the comments made beforehand, but there were really comments about good management. I spent my life not being a good manager. <laughs> Uh, and so I have none of these sort of general management rules. I'm an entrepreneur. I either start it or invent it or it's bankrupt. The advantage of all those things is you can't make it much worse, uh, <laughs> which helps. And particularly, it's actually easier to go into a company. I mean, my favorite bunch of stories is Aston Martin in England, which went bankrupt on Christmas Eve. And I finally put it in business about seven months later. And we made cars for a while, and they're still making cars. But starting totally from scratch is hard because you have to invent it all. If it's screwed up, you can actually go and figure it out. And in that case, the workforce had an IQ of 140, and the management had an IQ of 110. The workforce were so smart because they came out of World War II, and they didn't have a chance to go to school and get things. So if they were smart. They went to do something that required their brains. So what we did is we simply didn't hire the management back, and we asked the workforce what we were doing that's stupid. And we got 2,604 engineering change orders. But what I just brought to the bear it was that I didn't know how it was going to work out if I didn't do it. So you get curious. And the only way you're going to find out whether it's going to work is to try it. And then you get a bunch of people around you who feel the same enthusiasm. And that's the good luck of it. And then you get out of the way. <laughs> So actually, one of my first cars as a student was an Austin Maxi, a pretty ropey car. So ropey that the U fell off, and it said Aston Maxi. And I kept telling myself it's Aston Martin, but it, it certainly wasn't. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, Douglas, perhaps I can get your perspective on that, the rules that you've broken and what the consequences were, maybe. Oh, boy. Um, well, I kind of think about rules in a slightly different way. Uh, to, to me, the, if I look out at it, particularly in the life in retail, if you look out at the rules, per se, that to a large degree, certainly I spent my career working with great people that, uh, uh, along with uh, uh, the team we put together, helped break those rules or helped create the rules. So in a lot of instances, if you take Trader Joe's, which I started with in 1977, there were nine Trader Joe's and they were doing just a few million dollars. And um, if you wanted to try to survive, you weren't going to be able to follow the rules. You're going to have to find a different ground and in essence, try to recreate the rules. And so one of the things that certainly Trader Joe's has very successfully done is recreate the rules around private label, around store brand. Back in 1977, no one went to a store for their own brand. Uh, generally speaking, you never drove past a Stop and Shop or a Shaw's or a Star or out in Southern California, Vons or Ralph's or anything, to get the private label of that other company. So I think that Trader Joe's is very successful in, in recreating uh, a, a, a rule, so to say. I also think that um, you know when I when I look at the ventures I'm doing now with Daily Table, you know one of the rules we have, or often the rules we have, uh, have not included the human being in it. 
And so uh, by stepping back and looking at what are the issues here that we as human beings have a profound need for dignity in our interactions with uh, hunger relief, et cetera, uh, that's, that's been one of the things we've done. So I think that just stepping back and looking at, at rules in the sense of uh, one, where is it I need to help create the rules or recreate them, and where is it that those rules are keeping me uh, from succeeding have been very helpful. Thank you, sir. Dr. John uh, Hatsopoulos, you're, you were very cutting edge. You were doing something that was very pioneering uh, as you set up. And I wonder what, what rules you came across and what rules you had to break and how your path then evolved. Well, thank you very much. Uh, first, I should tell you that I've never worked any place other than Thermo Electron, uh, so I knew nothing. Uh, and I had a degree from Northeastern in history and mathematics, which also have nothing to do with business. <laughs> so we started the company again on everything against the logic. My brother was a professor of thermodynamics. Uh, we, by the way, our whole family was professors of thermodynamics in Greece. We are legal aliens, by the way. We are not <laughs> <laughs> illegal. We'll make sure that's known officially. <laughs> but anyhow, uh, when we started Thermo Electron on my brother's PhD thesis, which he gives me credit as a founder, it's not true. He was a good brother. Uh, so we started the company, and his point was there is a problem with energy and emissions. And guess who was the enemy of Thermo Electron? New York Times. New York Times kept writing articles about these crazies in Massachusetts that have a problem uh, with energy, which there should be no problem. So Thermo Electron has always broken the rules. Everything we did, we broke the rules. My brother was a good politician and a good scientist and he persuaded Congress to pass all kinds of laws about energy efficiency. Some of you might remember PURPA, which was to force utilities to buy alternative energy. Anyhow, the biggest break, though, was in 1980. President Carter, in his wisdom, took away 60% of the profits of Thermo Electron and 40% of the revenues by forbidding us to go to, to uh, market our products in Russia. Russia was buying everything we were making in the United States. Let's say Boeing would order us something from us. The Russians should say, we want three more of those. And it was all profit because the engineering was done. All of a sudden, we wake up one morning and 60% of our profits had disappeared because Dr. I mean, Mr. Carter forbid us to sell to Russia. Now we decide what to do. Uh, and there were five of us running the company. Really, my brother was running the company anyway. Uh, but uh, we started to talk about which projects. We had about 30 or 40 projects on energy, uh, and we most of them don't make, didn't make any money. So we decided we were talking about what to, to stop. One of the most important parts was the artificial heart. At that time, artificial heart had a bad name because of the original artificial heart that was marketed. So we thought, well, we had spent 20 years on it. Uh, we should stop it. It's costing us a lot of money. And I came up and I said, let's do something completely different and think about outside of the box. We should make companies out of all our ventures, go to Wall Street and one by one raise money on all these, keep control of these companies and uh, grow thermoelectron. The, by the way, the, I'll give you the ending. We had 24 companies, 24 public companies. 
At that time, I was a young man. I'm 85 years old now, so I'm not that young anymore. But uh, the head of the board, a fellow called Frank Jungers, who was the ex-CEO of Aramco before the Arabs took it over, uh, took me in a room and said, young man, you're making a mistake. Nobody has ever spun out ventures like this and you're going to destroy your life. You've done very well. You're the CFO of the company, uh, but you're wrong. But he says, you know, I will vote in favor of it because your brother told me I had to. <laughs> <laughs> so who is breaking the rules, you or your brother? <laughs> <laughs> well, my brother was listening to, you know, so we grew up together. He was eight years older. He was my boss, my brother. Everything. So anyway, uh, we did this. We invited, and as I mentioned a few minutes ago over breakfast, what we did, we invited all our institutions in, uh, from uh, the Northeast at our own expense to tell them about our spin-out strategy. I thought they'd be a little excited. The punchline is they all sold everything that they could. <laughs> we went to Europe, and every shares the Americans sold, they bought. We gave for 15 years a 32.3% annual report a return to our shareholders. Anyway. Because of the clock ticking, I'm going to get back to your story in a second uh, and get back to elements of what you've learned in the time since you started that. But I wanted to get to, uh, back to Peter because you'd mentioned how you found the engineers were the smart ones and the management were not. And I think what's happened with entrepreneurship nowadays is there's a much greater realization uh, for the need for inclusivity. Like I said, I end up working with uh, Narendra because of conscious capitalism. That's, that was brought to my attention. <coughs> so I wonder how you see uh, conscious capitalism and entrepreneurship taking a path of inclusivity developing in the coming years? Well, just one thing. <coughs> I didn't say engineers. I said the workforce. Workforce. All right. And Apologize. these were the guys who actually made the cars. Uh, behind them, they had engineers explaining it, but the workforce were as good as the engineers. Uh, I love problems. And everybody in this room is wearing a badge, for instance. And all your badges are pieces of paper in a plastic envelope. 207 million people wore badges to conferences and meetings last year. It's actually the same 20 million people going to 10 conferences. <laughs> and uh, what does your badge do? You sign up for the conference, and then you get there, and you wait in line until you get your badge. Well, what would happen if you made the badge part of your iPhone? But I didn't start off about conferences. I started off with people who were going deaf, like me or are deaf, and all of a sudden, how do I talk to somebody? Well, what would happen if I put a little microphone here, and when I talked, all of a sudden, it comes out in closed captions? It might even come out on that podium on a remote display, which is why it's called satellite displays. So it's a one and a half ounce badge that costs about 40 bucks to make, and you're gonna be able to wear it in a hospital situation and have your hands free and talk to somebody and if they speak Russian, you're going to be able to say, uh, hi, how are you feeling? And in Russian, it'll come out in Cyrillic, whatever the case may be, uh, it needs to be built. And I don't know what's going to happen, but the great joy of this thing is the process of saying, I don't know why it can't be done, and therefore, why don't you find a bunch of people who can do it and then see if you can do it? Maybe it'll work. Well, I know it'll work. Hopefully, there's a market for it. There's a huge learning curve because I, I dictate a lot of my texts, so I don't have to type them out in a hurry. And, it, and the number of mistakes I've had to go back and apologize for, uh, one of them telling my friends that my New Year's resolution was uh, fasting on Mondays and Wednesdays, which went as my New Year's resolution is farting on Mondays and Wednesdays. <laughs> and I hadn't noticed until someone said, well, I'll see you on Tuesdays and Thursdays. <laughs> so, Peter, let me get your perspective. Let me get your perspective on, on the importance of uh, a an, an, an path for, of entrepreneurship which is much more inclusive. It's not just the profits-driven approach. No, I think... I think I don't know, sorry. Yeah. No, that's right. I understood. Um, 
I think it's critical that uh, we step back and think about what the purpose of a corporation is. And certainly for entrepreneurs, hopefully entrepreneurs understand that at the heart, they're looking to provide value. They're looking to provide something of value, uh, goods or service that is out there, uh, you know, a blank spot, a need that needs to be filled. I think that even existing corporations, and we certainly see this in Business Roundtable, uh, Russia showed you here with, with a class that he teaches at Babson uh, regarding conscious capitalism, uh, that this is, this is an idea whose time has come that is so critical for us to understand that once again, business at heart is about creating prosperity and creating value, not extracting it. And part of that is a mentality that is around optimizing a value chain. I had the opportunity to study with Peter Drucker when he was still uh, teaching and uh, getting my executive MBA out in, at Claremont. Uh, many years after I started with Trader Joe's, I only woke up and, oh my God, I'm a grocer. How the heck did that happen? Uh, and so uh, one of the things Peter said was that the statement by Milton Friedman that uh, the sole purpose of a corporation is to maximize shareholder return. Anything else is socialism. It's probably the most damaging statement on business in the 20th century. And so his idea was that the second that you try to maximize a return to one stakeholder, you by definition minimize the value chain for the other stakeholders. It's a little bit like if you think about a business as a system, it's about your body. If you wanted to simply have a healthy liver and then destroyed your heart and your lungs and your pancreas to do it, I think that none of us would feel we had a healthy system. I think that conscious capitalism around recognizing that the purpose of a corporation is to create a value chain across all of the stakeholders. And John, you, you said you'd gone in with no real knowledge uh, except history and maths, uh, and, and you were starting up a company. Where did, did your, your company evolve to start to include the thought of where the stakeholder chain actually stretches to? Well, uh, it's interesting. First, let me make a statement that I honestly believe that the big power, uh, strength of the United States is number one, our constitution, but number two, the entrepreneurs. And having the bulk of our shareholders in Europe, uh, they keep trying to create entrepreneurs. Right now, France is spending a tremendous effort to create entrepreneurs. They can't. Ironic, because it's a French word. <laughs> <laughs> what is it? So, uh, I think we are the only country in the world, I mean, major country, that has entrepreneurship. I, I remember the Brits about 20 years ago tried it, and they still try, they don't succeed. I don't know, there is something in the genes of Americans to be entrepreneurs. And I'm very proud to be an American. And I'll give you an insight as a Brit. The, Ritz, the, Brit uh, the reason the Brits can't do it be is because it's a French word. <laughs> <laughs> just a quick, maybe we could wrap up with just a, a line on, on advice to young entrepreneurs. We've just got a, a few, uh, few minutes left. So uh, Peter, perhaps you could just, for the, the young generation coming up, what would be your one nugget of advice? Well, if I go to Silicon Valley and you look around, it turns out most of the great American, a third of the great American entrepreneurs in Silicon Valley were foreign born and US educated. Mm. So it seems to be something catching in the air. Uh, I found the most delightful thing because I've been in an odd collection of businesses in places like Iran for 15 years. I came up with one thing, which was Will Rogers made a comment that a stranger is a friend I haven't met. One of the joys of going into a brand new situation is there are a bunch of strangers. And out of the process, some of those people are going to become friends. And if that works, and they take that attitude as well, it's an adventure. And I think part of this whole thing, in, at least from my point of view, was the number of people that I, never, that I didn't know who became friends and changed my life. And so if I had to write a book on the thing, and I'm going to called Strangers and Friends, it would be not about, and then I got up in the morning and did this, or I bought that. Oh my God, at a cocktail party by random, I met somebody who became a, one of my closest friends. My Iranian partner became my closest friend. How the hell are you gonna get an Iranian partner? Well, start a business in Iran. Yeah. So, <laughs> you know, there we are. <laughs> 
it's, Douglas, it's perhaps fun. A, a nugget of wisdom for our, our young generation. Excuse me? I'm not asking uh, oh, Douglas. Yeah. No. Yeah. Well, I think that, I think that uh, first, I, I, I'd start with a recognition that the world needs you. And the world needs not just a lot more stuff, but it needs you and your entrepreneurial energy to go out and look at something you have passion around, something that is going to make a positive difference, something where you have a purpose that's far greater than just making a 10x or a 20x return, and that that is something that will hold you to it. I don't think, frankly, that uh, we've been sold a bill of goods thinking we're all out searching happiness for, for happiness, but happiness is something that actually ensues when you pursue something meaningful. And so I think that entrepreneurship can be that, that, that go after something that's meaningful, that will make a positive change, and you're far more likely to find happiness. Dr. Hatsopoulos, I'm going to ask you, apart from moving to America, what would be the advice I'll you I'll only take one minute. I took too long before. <laughs> That's okay. Uh, I wish we had more time. The only answer is think outside the box. You ask me how I did a lot of the crazy things I did. I'm a bridge player, and I used to play bridge worldwide when my brain was working. <laughs> <laughs> And that's how I ran my business. I mean, th how my brother ran his business. So it's play bridge, not poker. A round of applause, please, for our uh, wonderful panel. Thank you, gents. Thank you. Thank you, sir. That was a pleasure. Dr. Hasselblitz, thank you, sir. It is a shame we didn't have more time. We've got such wonderful wisdom uh, across those two panels, and I know they'd be more than happy for you to spend some time talking to them one-on-one, uh, -on -one. so make the most. That's the beauty of this summit is it's all about connections. It's called Babson Connect.